for language assistance services on election day. I would like to welcome everyone um, who's on today in the meeting and thank you so much for joining us. Um, Want to start off with a couple of technical assistance instructions for everyone. Um, to the CEC commissioners, um, as we've done in the past, audio for you will be enabled during the meeting. Um, however, we ask during um, during the meeting if you could just um, mute yourself if you're not speaking to avoid background noise. And you can either um, unmute yourself or raise um, your hand next to your name in the participant list on the menu control bar if you'd like to respond or make a comment. Um, to all other participants, um, you are muted upon entry and we will be enabling audio for people during the public comment period of this hearing, which should begin um, once we've had a chance to review, just to provide an overview of the rule that we'll be discussing today. And we will be calling on the participants in the order that they have registered for public comment. And once all the registered participants have offered their comment, we'll then open the floor for additional participants who didn't previously register, but would like to offer um, comment today. And you are encouraged to use a chat option to indicate if you'd like to offer testimony um, and or you can also click on the raise hand icon next to your name in the participant list. And if you are joining this meeting by phone today, um, and don't have access to a computer monitor, you can also text your name and affiliation to 646-763-2189. Again, that number is 646-763-2189 if you'd like to offer comment. Um, the meeting host will then enable the audio and call on the dial-in participant by name to offer the public comment. And again, it'll be in order that the text was received. You can also enable um, closed captioning by selecting more options, which is the icon um, with the ellipsis, the three dot, or yeah, it's like three dots. Um, and you can click that to see an option for um, closed captioning. So, um, to begin and start us off, I'd like to ask the commissioners to please state their name and briefly introduce themselves. And um, I guess I'm going to just um, say the order in which I think you can speak because I'll just that'll make it easier for you. So um, we've got Donna, Aneta. Um, Mark, Murad, and if I miss if I'm missing anyone, please please go ahead. So Donna, would you like to start us off? And Amy, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donna Gill, <clears throat> um, the C Commissioner from Central Harlem. Thank you. Amy, would you like to go? Amy Breedlove, uh, Commissioner from Brooklyn. Murad. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Murad Awada, uh, Commissioner from Brooklyn as well. Uh, Netta. Good afternoon, Aneta Sicharan, Commissioner from Queens and executive director of Chaya. Thank you. Uh, Mark? I think you're still on mute. Mark? Um, not sure what happened there. Um, Mark, if you can hear us, we'd love to have you introduce yourself. Am I missing any other commissioners who are on the call? 
like to introduce yourself? Okay. Um, okay. Um, hopefully we can uh, connect with Mark and if anyone else comes on a little bit later, we can get them to introduce themselves. Um, just for the record, uh, my name is Sarah Said, and I am one of the 15 commissioners who make up the Civic Engagement Commission and I'm also the chair and executive director. Um, just as a reminder, our main purpose here today is to hear from members of the public about the Civic Engagement Commission's proposed rule for establishing minimum standards for individuals who will be providing language assistance services um, in the CEC's poll site interpretation um, program, the poll site language assistance program on election day. And if you recall, um, we are charter mandated to be to begin providing poll site language assistance in November 2020. And I wanted to just begin sort of like with a very basic overview about rules because I did also just to sort of ground myself as to what we were doing here today um, and why it's important to do what we're doing today. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people think about city rules and regulations and maybe um, don't understand them and also meetings like this end up being sort of uninteresting to the public, maybe even boring. So I wanted to just um, explain why I think, you know, we're here today and also possibly to help people who might not have, you know, might not have attended a space like this. So, um, a rule is a type of law that is proposed and adopted by a city agency and very specific to the work of the agency. Um, it defines how the agency will implement relevant laws when conducting its programs, and it's not applicable to other agencies. It's just you know unique to a particular agency making the rule. And what makes a rule is that there's actually a specific process that agencies have to follow to create or amend the rule under the City Administrative Procedure Act. And the rulemaking process takes a minimum of 60 days. And during that time, agencies are asked to provide New Yorkers with an opportunity to review and comment on the proposed rule. This is different from a law, which also goes through a public hearing process, as everyone knows, but that is initiated um, as a bill sponsored by a legislator or a group of legislators and voted on in the city council and signed off by the mayor. Um, city agencies make all kinds of rules, as you all know, and these impact the public. Some of the most common rules that we can probably think of are rules about speed limits, stopping, standing, garbage collection, noise rules. Uh, firework rules <laughs> to be more relevant to the moment we're in. Um, and since these rules impact residents, it's really important that we allow for a democratic process that allows the public to review the rules and provide feedback before they're finalized. And if we didn't have this process, city agencies would, we would all be risking making rules that don't help the public and may even make things more difficult and we may not be able to abide by uh, legal guidelines. So rules are here to establish a common standard um, and they are meant to make life more predictable um, and to promote coexistence. Um, rules are also related to regulations which are enforceable because they define exactly what's expected. Um, and I bet that there are people on this call who have been through this process before um, and if any of the other commissioners want to chime in here at this point about rules, regulations, laws, I open the floor for you to do that. Um, does anyone want to add anything to what I've said about the significance of today? Um, so today's hearing is about the specific rule that CEC will follow when it provides language assistance services at full sites. And this rule does two things. We're going to get into a little bit more, but 
It sets a minimum standard for the qualification of interpreters who provide services, and it sets a requirement for what type of training the interpreter should receive before they provide these services. And given that the commission will be providing interpretation services in a variety of languages, and that we're gonna be working alongside the Board of Elections to provide voluntary services, we have to set out guidelines that comply with laws related to providing services during elections, including laws such as, you know, what are the hours of voting, when poll sites open and close, the expected conduct to protect voter privacy, prevent electioneering. This rule that we're talking about today went through a process of being drafted and internally reviewed by the city law department. The draft was discussed and voted on in our last commissioner's meeting on May 20th, as everyone remembers, it was here before. We posted a public comment 30 days before the public hearing today. And once all of the testimony is taken in today and the comments that were sent in, we may then modify the rule based on this feedback and um, as necessary draft a final version. And once that version is finalized, the copy is paste, uh, posted on to NYC rules, published in the city record and submitted to city council. And the rule will take effect 30 days after the final version is published. Um, so we're going to prepare now to um, hear from our um, from Guggen Kaur, who's the commissioner's advisor on language access and community boards, to provide a very brief overview of the final methodology for our full site interpretation program and the rule for interpreter training and qualifications. After that, we will begin the comment period, and each commenter will speak up to three minutes, and we'll be running a timer to help us keep on track. Once the commenter finishes, the commissioners will have the floor to ask clarifying questions. And as we did in the previous public hearing, let's um, stick to between two to three clarifying questions. And we will hold comments on the comments um, until the end, after everyone has uh, you know, submitted their testimony. And if the commissioners don't have any questions, I'll also see if any of the staff wants to ask questions on the comments. Um, are, does anyone have any question on the procedure that we're following today? Okay, I'm now going to, oh, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Diller. I'm the Manhattan Borough representative to the Civic Engagement Commission. Uh, sorry to be joining you a little bit late. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm just making sure that there's no other commissioner who joined us. I think we're okay. All right. So I am going to now um, turn it over to Duggan. I'll put myself on mute. Duggan, can you start your presentation? Of course. Um, thank you, Dr. Saeed. Thank you, commissioners. Um, and thank you, everyone from the community joining us today. Um, hope you're all safe and well. Um, we thought it might be helpful to briefly frame the methodology that will inform our programming in November before speaking to the proposed rules um, under the methodology. And a lot of you may already be familiar with the methodology. I know many of you were at our public hearing in February, so we'll be sharing more of the top line. Um, the CEC is charged under Chapter 76 of the City Charter with establishing a poll site language assistance program to provide interpreters of poll sites throughout New York City for the purpose of facilitating participation by voters with limited English proficiency in elections held in the city starting in November 2020. The poll site language assistance program is supplemental to the language services provided by the New York City Board of Elections mandated under the Voting Rights Act. The CEC was charged with publishing the preliminary methodology um, by January 1st, um, then receiving public comments for 30 days, and then revising and publishing the final methodology by April 1st, which um, is located on our website. The methodology informs how languages and poll sites are determined for the poll site language assistance program. As I mentioned, this methodology will be in effect starting with the November general election, um, and for the November 2020 election, the CEC will provide services 
in the 10 most commonly spoken languages, um, plus Yiddish and Italian. So the languages the CEC will be providing assistance in are Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, which includes Cantonese and Mandarin, French, Haitian Creole, Italian, Korean, Polish, Russian, Urdu, and Yiddish. And um, as I mentioned, this program is supplemental to the language assistance provided by the Board of Elections. The CEC may not provide services in languages and counties in which the Board of Elections already provides assistance. For example, the BOE provides support for Bangla in Queens County, but does not in Richmond County and does not in Manhattan County. So the CEC may provide services in Bangla on Staten Island or in Manhattan, but not in Queens. In addition, um, so to ensure that documents like the proposed rules and our methodology are accessible to community members, um, prior to hearings, we like to hold um, briefing calls or conversations with community members to run through the content. So to that, um, to that point, the CEC convened a stakeholder roundtable on June 18th, focused on training materials developed by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and Mayor's Office of Operations, um, which are the two agencies, as you may recall, that ran the pilot interpretation program prior to the CEC. All of these materials will be revised prior to utilization with interpreters in the November 2020 general election. And the purpose of the roundtable was to share uh, not only the training content, uh, but to also garner community feedback, provide an overview of CEC's proposed rule on minimum standards and training requirements for interpreters, and also to discuss today's hearing. The CBOs that were in, um, in attendance during that roundtable are Arab American Association of New York, Council of People's Organization, or COPO, Muslim Community Network, CARE, Shetty Yatu Center for African Women, the Chinese American Planning Council, and the Hispanic Federation. Um, we received so many thoughtful suggestions during the roundtable um, and shared all of our materials with the community-based organizations to provide them with additional time to sit with the, the actual training content and circle back to the CEC with thoughts and considerations that might come later on as they study the content further. The CEC also convened um, the Language Assistance Advisory Committee on June 24th with the same focus and agenda as a stakeholder roundtable, as many of our LAC members are also part of community um, community-based organizations or have deep ties um, with the communities that they serve. So um, during that, during the LAC meeting, the LAC members were also um, made privy to all of the training content, and we also reviewed um, the proposed rule and created space for discussion and also um, to garner further feedback. And um, I just wanted to note that. If commissioners are interested in viewing the content or the conversation um, that took place during the stakeholder roundtable, we did record that meeting. Um, so if folks are interested, we can share that um, with you all as well. I also want to acknowledge um, the great comments and questions that the commissioners raised at the last meeting. Um, some of those comments included more clarification um, on the root of certain words or how the CEC will be utilizing them. Um, language that came up was um, such as electioneering, um, defining professionalism, defining how cultural context fits into the work that we're um, trying to do. Um, commissioners also raised the recommendation to include language around respect in the rule and also a clarifying question that we received both from the commissioners but also community partners as well around how the CEC will screen, um, will screen interpreters to ensure that they are, um, they can speak both English and the target language to be served. I wanted to provide this brief um, overview of the methodology that will govern our program and also the work CEC is doing with community partners and a brief um, mention of like our conversation, our last conversation with the commissioners on the proposed rule to allow folks who may have not been present in the earlier portions of this process or this discussion and understanding of what has been discussed and done um, to date. And now um, getting into the actual rule itself, um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm looking over here because I'm using a monitor just to let y'all know. Uh, give me one second. So now I'm going to ask you the annoying question of, can you see my PowerPoint and my screen? 
thumbs up, awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> the only annoying thing is I cannot, oh, actually, so you can see this, that would be perfect. All right, let's give me one second. Do you folks also see the slides on the side? But you can still see the full slide. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, is it if okay? you um, if you put the uh, if you click on the the thing that says set up show, I think you'll probably get full screen out of that if you want it. Um, but is it is it legible the way it is? To me, sure. Okay, let me yeah, but I, I mean it it could get tougher with this the next slides. Yeah, very true. I'm just it's overwhelming my computer to go into the full screen. I'm sorry, I need to get a new computer. If you just do start slideshow. Yeah, when I do start slideshow, it overwhelms my computer. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. We can get started and then you, you should just, you should just you can zoom into you can also zoom into the slide if the if it gets a little bit harder to read. Thank you, Marad. Okay, perfect. So um the commissioners are always so kind and patient. They go through um these these presentations often. Um so just starting with um the proposed rule, the the commission um, under the full site language assistance program um, is charged with promulgating rules that set minimum requirements um, around standards and training um, for individuals who provide assistance for voters under the program. And the rule has four different sections. Um, the first and lengthier piece of the rule um, is on standards of conduct that interpreters must comply with. And um, the interpreters must comply with the following standards um, with all lawful orders from the staff of the Board of Elections, which includes but is not limited to making an oath or signing an affirmation um, as required by Section 8306 of the New York City, uh, New York State Election Law. Interpreters may not engage in electioneering in the polling place or within 100 feet of the polling place. They may not directly or indirectly reveal to any person the name of any particular candidate, party, ticket, ballot question voted for by a voter, and they must comply with all applicable laws, including Article 8 and 17 of New York State Election Law. Interpreters must also comply with the following ethical standards set forth um, by adapted from the National Council on Healthcare Interpreter Certifications Code of Ethics, which include confidentiality. Interpreters will regard all information obtained during the performance of their professional duties as confidential. Impartiality, the interpreter will perform their duties in an impartial way, refraining from advising, counseling, or conveying any personal beliefs or biases to the voter. Accuracy, the interpreter will strive to relay all information accurately in the course of their professional duties, preserving the spirit of the original message, taking into consideration its cultural context. Professionalism. The interpreter will at, at all times act in a professional and ethical manner, maintaining the boundaries of the professional role and abstaining from personal involvement. The next um, portion of the rule goes into um, the minimum qualifications. The commission shall ensure that all interpreters have written and spoken fluency in English and the language to be served. The next piece is on training requirements and the commission shall ensure that all interpreters receive at least one training 
prior to each election event, and at minimum, the training must include ethical guidance for interpreters that will include the standards of conduct set forth in subdivision A of the section. And the reason this piece is really important is because it ensures that the code of conduct that's set forth in Section A, which includes complying with BOE's lawful orders, not engaging in electioneering, respecting voter privacy, and the pieces adapted from the National Council on Healthcare Interpreter Certification Code of Ethics, um, the confidentiality, confidentiality, impartiality, accuracy, and professionalism, all of this must be included and expanded upon within the training at the most minimum level. So all of the pieces outlined prior uh, must be included within the training. This allows the CEC to expand and define all of this terminology more specifically as it relates to the program itself. The training must also include a process for tracking the number of voters the interpreter served and a protocol for collecting and reporting public complaints regarding, regarding the program. The second piece, the protocol for collecting and reporting public complaints is, it, is um, very unique to the CEC's program and did not um, exist within the pilot program prior. The last piece of the rule um, expresses that if the commission engages in partnership with city agencies to provide language assistance services to voters outside of polling places, including but not limited to absentee voters, such services must substantially comply with the provisions of this chapter. So um, given the, the current public health situation and changes that may occur in the elections landscape over the coming years, this ensures that even with changing programs, the interpreters must still comply um, with the provisions set forth in this proposed, in this proposed rule. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Okay. So we've just reviewed um, just the overview of the methodology and a brief presentation on the proposed rule. I now pass it um, back to Dr. Saeed um, to open space for testimony. Thank you, Duggan. Um, so we're gonna now open the floor for testimony. And as I mentioned before, we're going to call on enable audio for participants who signed up to offer testimony prior to this meeting in the order that we received those requests. And then also if you haven't signed up, um, you can, again, as a reminder, click on the participant icon um, found on the menu control bar. And when you see, when you click on it, you'll see your name on the right side of this um, screen. And you will see a raise hand icon next to your name. You can click that raise hand I icon and you can send a chat message with your name and affiliation to sign up. And we'll also enable uh, audio for you if you, once you sign up to uh, offer your comment. Again, I'm gonna remind, I don't know if we have anyone here. I can't tell, I don't think anyone's on the phone, but just in case it's not on my screen, um, you can text your name and affiliation to 646-763-2189. Uh, if you'd like to offer public comment and you're on the phone and the meeting host will enable the audio for you once we um, are, are at your uh, name. So um, I believe, Guggen, you have the names of people who've signed up um, for comment today. So we'll um, have you call on each person. Um, each person will have three minutes. Did we, did I run the timer or? run the timer on my phone um, and then once that person is done we will um, see if anyone has questions um, or any of the commissioner have has questions um, and then we'll go to the next person so who is on who is next yes or first. so like Dr. Saeed said, um, the first person will testify. The commissioners will then have opportunity to um, ask one or two clarifying questions. 
Um, so the first person that is offering testimony today is Tawsif Asan from New York Public Interest Research Group, or NICPER. <clears throat> Uh, hey, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and begin. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Taos Fasan. I'm the Civic Engagement Coordinator for the New York Public Interest Research Group, known as NIPERG. Uh, so to tell you a little bit about us, we're a nonpartisan, not-for-profit research and advocacy organization. Uh, we work on the issues of consumer protection, environmental preservation, healthcare, higher education, and governmental reforms. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to share our views on the rule for post site interpreters and training content. So in such a diverse city, the importance of adequate and well-trained translators to increase civic access cannot be overstated. New York City has been plagued by systemic problems with the administration of elections and within our state election law. In their wisdom, city voters created the Enga uh, Civic Engagement Commission your mandate for enhanced translation services recognizes the limited and often inadequate job that the Board of Elections has done providing services. Incredibly, the Board of Election, the Board has even fought against providing supplemental translation services. We're heartened that the program is moving forward, even during the pandemic, and we wish you success in your work. Uh, below are our recommendations in regards to the proposed rule, as well as additional thoughts on training practices. Uh, one, to underscore the importance of nonpartisanship and guard against unintended influences, we believe a new section should be added, perhaps after section four, which states, do not directly or indirectly reveal to any person or make public any aggregate totals for any particular candidate, party, ticket, or ballot question voted for by uh, the voters they assist. Two, public access to information about translation services and experiences on election days is important when rolling out a new program. Regarding point 6C, um, three, a protocol for collecting and reporting public complaints regarding the program, we call on the commission to compile and release complaint data collected by translators and other facets of their work, both contemporaneously to share with the various city and state election authorities monitoring the election and in a public report released no later than one month after the election. And three, uh, to protect translators from misidentification and provide visual cues for voters in need of service, we suggest the inclusion of an additional section, perhaps after section six, which states shall conspicuously display identification provided by the commission while performing their duties. And on the subject of translator training, uh, the proposed rule requires that the commission provide at least one training for such individuals prior to each election event and establishes minimum requirements for the content of the commissioner training. While it does not seem the specifics of the training are meant to be covered in this set of rules, it is still an important issue for the commission. We call on the commission to ensure that interpreter trainings are comprehensive and accessible. Uh, for one, the training should cover all aspects of the board's elections, uh, translator program, or publicly explain why they are leaving certain elements out. The commission provided training should also cover all aspects of voter rights at poll sites, not just fundamental operations. Um, translators should also be well trained on de-escalation strategies. And finally, we urge the commission to begin preparing for implementation of their new voter program during the likely continuation of the pandemic through election day. We urge that a plan should be developed in consultation with the civic community to provide outreach and assistance to voters, alerting them to CEC translation services via phone, text, and social media through the absentee ballot process, early voting, and election day itself. And we look forward to continuing this conversation throughout the rulemaking process and the creation of training materials. Thank you for your opportunity to testify. So much for that. And um, just want to make sure that you, everyone who is submitting comment today, that we have uh, a written or electronic version of whatever you uh, are sharing with us. So be really helpful for us. Um, so for I'm going to turn to the commissioners to see if you have any clarifying questions. Uh, one question. So you, Amy Breedlove, 
So you uh, did say about getting feedback, I think it was um, within 60 days after the election of any issues with the interpreters. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, give me give me one moment. I'm just going to look to see if um, that's the uh, that's the figure that we suggested. Um, it had to do with complaint data, right? Yeah, that's complaint. correct. Um, right. We call on the commission to compile complaint data. No later than one month. That was our recommendation. Okay. And yes, is, there, is there anything else in there that you're asking then for a process by which that um, complaint data results in some actions? Um, that's not part of our testimony, but if that's something that you would like to discuss with us, we'd be happy to have that conversation. Um, right now, I just don't want to comment on that because it's uh, not part of the conversation that we've been having so far. Um, right, right now, we're just saying that uh, there should be a mechanism by which the complaint data is corrected, uh, collected and made available. Okay, thank you. Mark, you had a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, it, it was clear that uh, Mr. Hassan was reading from something and I'm just hoping that that has been submitted to you, to you and that uh, to the extent that's necessary that it be shared with us before any final rulemaking is done, because it sounds like there are a couple of good ideas in there, but I would want to actually read them uh, in, you know, side by side with the um, with the actual text of the proposed rule. So, yes, we, we will. Um, yeah, it's uh, um, you know, it's uh, your first to send a written testimony. Um, ahead of the verbal testimonies that we give. So you should have that. But if you don't, I could go ahead and just send it to you after this. I'll, I'll rely on our wonderful staff to, to take that up. If you submit it to them, then we're all set. Thank you so much, Tosif. Um, really appreciate your testimony. I'm also going to um, share a timer on screen just so um, folks can see. Yeah, I mean, I, I I was wondering if I should hold my phone up like this, but you probably wouldn't be able to see it. So I'm trying to figure out, we've, we've got to figure out that um, piece of it. But are there any, does, do any of the other commissioners have any clarifying questions? I had a question. Uh, this is Donna Gill. Uh, the visual clues. <laughs> What do you propose as a visual clue, a, a badge, uh, a sign, you know, uh, something? What, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the interpreters. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that I have any examples to give you right now. Um, if you want to, I, I can definitely follow up with the commission um, to provide some examples. Um, I wasn't part of those conversations, so I, I actually don't know what examples of um, visual clues that that we would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm now going to invite the next speaker to offer testimony. Um, I invite Gather Zina Horner, um, who is a professional interpreter, to um, join us and offer testimony. Um, yeah, there's, you know, when you're ready, I'll start the timer. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so my name is uh, Katarzyna Horner, and I'm a language-related services professional. I'm a certified translator by the American Translators Association, a certified healthcare interpreter by Certification Commission care interpreters and a licensed community interpreter trainer. I have read and analyzed the proposed rule on setting minimal, uh, minimal uh, standards and training requirements for poll site interpreters. And as an active interpreter, I would say that this is exactly what I would expect. I am glad that um, such issues as confidentiality and voter autonomy have been included and the prospective um, 
interpreters fluency in English and languages and other than English languages that they would serve will be tested. And also because uh, there is a big difference between being just bilingual and uh, being a professional interpreter, I'm also glad that the appropriate training will be provided to the interpreters, which will be crucial in the situation. And finally, in, in terms of uh, recruiting for interpreters, I would like to suggest that uh, reaching out to those interpreters who are already active in uh, such fields as legal and medical interpreting would, could be the most beneficial method uh, since most of them have been already trained and uh, certified in some way which would make the uh, training process much easier and, um, and shorter for everyone. So thank you so much and thank you for the ability to testify today. Thank you so much, Katarzyna. Thank you. And now commissioners, if you um, have any clarifying questions um, for Katarzyna. Good, we're looking good. Thank you so much, Katarzyna. We really appreciate your testimony. Um, and like we said earlier, um, at your earliest convenience, if you could send us a um, written version of this testimony so we can share it with our commissioners as well, that would be great. Will do, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm going to invite the next speaker to offer testimony. Um, inviting Ali Gaba from Muslim Community Network. And just like before, I will share um, the timer on screen whenever you're ready, Ali. Do we have Ali Kaba um, joining us right now? Are you on the on the line? Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. We can hear you now. Oh, oh, just give me a second. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, uh, okay. Can you guys hear me? Absolutely. You're clear. Okay. Uh, thank you for allowing. Uh, Sorry, man. thank you for allowing the Muslim Community Network to testify today. My name is uh, Ali Kaba. I am the census captain at the at MCN. One of the MCN goals is to develop the capacity of Muslim, New Yorker, and the ally to fully participate in the social and political landscape of New York City. We have been uh, achieving this uh, through, uh, through uh, my NYC youth program, diversity education and community engagement. Canada, the census work as part of our community engagement. We have realized that the Muslim community is considered one of the hard richer community in America. Factors that, that maybe contribute to this are limited English proficiency, lack of trust in government, misinformation about the census. As a result, we, ho uh, we host a virtual form banking section and teaching about the census in eight different languages, of the, which are, which are uh, Bengali, of uh, Udu, French, English, Fulani, and Mandi, and Sonic. And doing that, we are able to reach out to the community men who stand out to be undercounted, as well as a total of 26,000 engagement. This would, not has, uh, this would not have such impact if we didn't engage uh, in the language actor in serving our community. In the same way, as we are approaching, in, as we are transiting into a civic engagement, such as voting, Having the new uh, uh, proposal issued by the New York, New York City Engagement Commission will be a great resource to share with our community. That is in part because of many American Muslims are fluent in other languages besides English and often speak in those languages more than 50% of the time in their daily life. Also, the Muslim in New York, according to the crew of U.S. Uh, religious landscape in 2014, is a growing population, make up about 8 to 9% for the New York City proper, which is nearly 800,000 people. This so will encourage us to, on the, the alienated vote on New York, on the alienated Muslim 
we look forward to vote and provide them with a welcoming environment that will be good for the that will be good for a representative democracy like ours. One recommendation we would like to put forward would be to uh, lessen the mini, uh, the minimal qualification for the interpreter as to include the often forgotten language that do not have their own writings, such as Wolof, uh, Fulani, Hausa, and many others. And having these uh, uh, languages, languages uh, having these, having the interpreter of this language at the polling site also help to encourage voters for this community to feel included. Overall, this new uh, proposal will make uh, um, voting much easier as such it should be adopted. Thank you so much, Anijas. Thank you, Ali Kaba. Um, we really appreciate your testimony. Um, do the commissioners have um, any clarifying questions for Ali? Uh, uh, yeah, this is um, Ananta Sicharan. I wanted to hear a little bit more specifics around the, um, the qualifications that's being, if any, um, that uh, that is being recommended. Um, what I heard was that uh, there is a request to lessen the qualifications. But I yeah, wonder so, if you have any okay. thoughts about what specific qualifications would you would uh, consider to be adequate. Um, so what I was what I was thinking was that as I read, I'm sorry, there's kind of bit noise here. I'm sorry. Um, what I was thinking as I read on the proposal, I was thinking that uh, the 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 speaker or the, the interpreter must uh, must um, possess a, a qualification in a both in written and uh, in a spoken in that language for it to be for the person to be a translator. And I think that often sometimes people may often be well influenced in these uh, um they, they may be well influenced on this link, but that does not necessarily mean that they, there's a um, actually a writing system. So such a like the Wolof and Fulani, for example, is a predominantly um, spoken languages in the Muslim American community, but it does not have its own writing system. So making a requirement such as a strong writing system, can you guys hear me or not? Can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, do you... I didn't finish with my talk, but I thought you guys didn't. Uh, do you guys heard what I said? Or not? Yes, we heard you. If you're not, if you're not finished, please continue. Oh, I'm sorry. So I was just saying that. Um, so in terms of the mini, uh, um, to minimize the qualification of the translator, so to include the often forgotten link that do not have their own writing system, such as Wolof and Fulani, out of that. These are languages that are mostly spoken by Muslim American New Yorker. And I think having a specific strong requirement for writing, I think that would definitely, definitely hinder to these people that actually need to translate at the polling site, especially people that speak these languages. They often they are well invested in the spoken, but they do not have a writing system. So I don't know if I'm being understood. You're being understood. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Do commissioners have additional questions um, for Ali? Thank you so much, Ali. Um, and just as we requested um, from previous folks, if you could, um, at your earliest convenience, send us over a written um, copy of your testimony um, so we can share with our commissioners as well as review ourselves, that would be great. So that concludes um, folks who've uh, signed up to testify ahead of time. Um, Dr. Said, should we continue into the next portion um, and invite additional comments? Yes, we can do that. Is there anyone who has not signed up before who would like to make a comment? I see Aaron Hanif has his hand raised or their hand raised. Is that for 
interest in offering testimony? Yes. Okay. Can I start now? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Aram Hanif. Uh, uh, I am the Chief Executive Officer of Apna Brooklyn Community Center, and I'm also a member of uh, Language Assistance Advisory Committee representing the Urdu speaking community. So I have actually two questions. Uh, first of all, um, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, we really appreciate all the great work CEC is doing uh, and incorporating all the languages uh, um, for the interpretation services, which were, uh, which were never included in this whole process. So it's a great effort uh, by all the commissioners and uh, Dr. Sarah Saeed. We really appreciate it. So I have two questions. One is that uh, will the ethnic media will be used in terms of sharing this information that poll site interpretation services will be available in all yes. 10 or 12 different languages or not? Secondly, about the employment or hiring of the interpreters, um, will it be announced on uh, by using the ethnic media, or will the community-based organizations will be involved in this process or not? And one last point which I want to mention is that uh, because I deal with the senior population, mostly of them are Urdu and Punjabi uh, speaking uh, senior members of my community. So when they go on the polling site, the ballot paper itself is available as an English language. So a senior who cannot read or write English, will the interpreters will be allowed to read the name of the candidates which are on the ballot paper or not? Because a senior who does not know how to read English, he does not know what's the name of the on the ballot is written, how are they going to continue voting? Okay, so that's all from my side for the time being. Uh, so I can, um, if there is any other, you know, clarifying questions from me, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Um, if you could elaborate on this a little bit, so what I'm what I'm hearing is that a a senior comes in, and their eyesight is not good, and so therefore they cannot see the names on the ballot. So they would need to understand who the names are, and then also I would think that someone might need to fill in the bubble for them. Or no, no. Yeah. Not like that. Uh, it's like, obviously, most of the seniors are from South Asian community, those who speak English, uh, Bengali, Urdu, or Punjabi languages, uh, they either, some of them have never been to school, or some of them have not completed their high school. So obviously, English reading skills are zero, right? And on the ballot paper, when they are going to cast their vote, the names on the ballot paper, actually, they're not able to read all these names. So if there is a family member with them or somebody, they can read and tell them. But in case of interpreter, the will the interpreters will be allowed to read the name of the candidates to the seniors or not? That's the point. And the font size, I've always noticed that on the ballot paper, the font size of the name is always very small. So it's like sometimes even an adult is going, it's you have to like, closely put a ballot paper in front of you to read it appropriately, what names are written on the paper. Okay, there are a number of, a number of complicated issues you bring up and I thank you for that. Um, I think maybe someone from the commission can answer the question about reading the names uh, of the candidates. Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much, Iram, for um, raising those important questions. And um, it, it would be great to receive um, your thoughts and comments in written form as well. Um, we, we don't usually address um, questions during public hearings, but this is um, just to quickly um, share that the interpreter training um, that we shared with um, LAC members and in attend with um, stakeholders reviews this, this process that we're discussing. Um, and the question that you're raising around um, interpreters' ability 
literally translate the entire um, tablet. That is part of the scope of responsibilities of the interpreter. They must orally translate the entire ballot in its full form, including instructions and including names of um, individuals, including um, um, ballot proposals. They must read the full document in full and offer no um, personal um, preference, guidance, political opinions, none of that, just reading um, and responding to the document, um, reading the whole document in full in, all, in its full accuracy. But it would be um, Aaron, a great to receive um, this in written form, and um, we really appreciate you raising these questions because these also feed into um, things that we need to be considering as a commission, um, it, things that need to be included in our interpreter training that we are revising prior to sharing with interpreters in um, for the November 2020 election. So just a tiny note on the, um, the training content timeline. Um, the commission um, met with some stakeholders. We will continue to meet with additional community-based partners um, and revise the content in um, July and August, um, taking into consideration all the comments that we received, um, and then develop a finalized training that we will then share with you all as well prior to using um, with interpreters. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to? I don't see any other. Is anyone else's hand raised or would like to speak? There's a question here in the chat about, oh, you put it in there. Great. So anyone who uh, hasn't yet emailed their testimony, please send it to Guggen. And that email, her emails in the chat. So, um, anyone else? If you does, anyone else have a comment? Okay. Um, so I'm going to now. If there are no other comments from participants. Um, I'd like to just open it up for commissioners to have discussion. Do you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to share based on what we heard? Uh, if I can jump in. Of course. Thanks. So uh, Mr. Hassan uh, brought up a couple of very specific points that I thought were worthy of some consideration. Um, the small but very important point about wearing credentials in a way that uh, the, having, I'm sorry, backing up, having the interpreters uh, wear credentials that identify them appropriately. I assume that there will be some sort of credential um, because they would need that in order to gain access to the poll site. Anyway, um, that makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, um, there was something in his testimony, which I hope we will see in, in writing, having to do with interpreters being required to refrain from disclosing uh, certain uh, personal information or, or, co or collective information. Um, and I think that that is, I think, if I understood the comment correctly, it was not to, in effect, share what other people, who other people are voting for, or some sort of cumulative idea of, of that. Um, I think it's it's part and parcel of the professional responsibilities that are already outlined in the um, in the uh, existing proposed rule, but I have no objection to including a specific like that. Um, with respect to the complaint data, um, uh, uh, I think 30 days is awfully ambitious, but uh, but some kind of recap of that does make sense to me. Uh, Ms. Horner um, uh, suggested reaching out to certified legal and business translators, um, and that is an implementation issue, but I think it makes a lot of sense, too. Um, and, um, uh, and that's all I've got, other than uh, thanking those who uh, came out for uh, offering these good comments. Appreciate it.
Yes, I, I too want to thank everyone for their testimony today. I think there are a few things um, that I'm sure we have already examined, but it's clear based on the testimony today that we may want to look a little bit deeper into the issues of uh, literacy, uh, both on the interpreter side as well as on the, uh, I'll call it the voter side or the client side. Um, so I don't need to go into any more on that, but I think we need to have that on our list of a little bit further investigation. And also I've been thinking a lot about the elderly and um, those who have, um, you know, different um, issues when it comes to navigating the polling sites and the ballot itself. Um, I know that there are a lot of elderly that, who say to me when I help them, um, you know, where's so-and-so's name? And they want you to just find it for them. Um, and so I'm a little, you know, it's not really directing them to tell them who to vote for, but they do like an indication of where it is because the way they see the ballot, there's a lot going on. And so they, they would like their eyes to the help for their eyes to be focused on where they need to, to fill in the bubble. So, um, that I think is something. You know, it's a it's a gray area, but I just want to bring it up as something that I have seen that we might want to think about. Um, but I really appreciate all of the testimony today, and I think there was a lot of good information. And as Mark said, once we get the the written testimony, I think we can dig in a little bit deeper and really um, take take very uh, informative um, information. Thank you. Uh... This is Donna Gill, and uh, my questions, comments were um, basically directed to Ms. Horner uh, because she is actually an interpreter that is doing this. And um, if we have, if we're going to have to um, hire people or hire an agency that is equipped to do this kind of, of work, I, I was just wondering if there was some um, pointers that she can give us uh, on this and of uh, the, the organizations that are actually doing the, the testing and um, the training, basically, so that we would have a better idea as to what to look for and um, so we'd be able to to have make this seemingly painless. Um, and the fact that she is doing the work and she is uh, um, she is an interpreter, I figure she may be able to give us some points. That's um, <clears throat> the first thing. And yes, I do also want to thank everyone for their testimony. Um, I'm hearing from Miss Ali and Ms. Hanif that our cultural competency is actually needed with interpreters because um, they're going to have to understand the individuals that the voters that they're working with. And sometimes uh, if you're if you know the culture of um, of the individual, it's a little easier to have uh, that type of transition or because a lot of times people are not as accepting of help even though it is to their benefit if they don't perceive that they're being respected as a person. Donna, I don't know if you can see me sh uh, shaking my head yes, so I just thought I'd say that out loud. Yeah, I agree with that as well. And I think that it's uh, not just cultural, but linguistic, linguistically competent. Um, a lot of uh, folks who, you know, just to give you an example, 
folks who speak um, Arabic, there's a number of different dialects and a number of different uh, cultural sensitivities sometimes in voting. Um, so we just want to make sure that in, in the training that folks are aware of those and um, know how to appropriately respond in a way that's not diminishing or uh, undermining uh, the voting process. Are there any other um, comments or thoughts from commissioners at this point? The only other thing that I would want to add is that the relatively few number of people who felt they needed to come out and testify can be interpreted as a um, well, interpreted. Sorry about that. Uh, can be can be viewed as a uh, as a testament to the good work done by the staff in preparing all of this all these materials. Uh, so congratulations to Guggen and the whole team. Yes, I, I I wanted to. I was having the same thought, and I wanted to um, also say that I think well, I, I think that we heard some really good recommendations and. Um, this evening, overall, I think we um, we're in good shape with this. Yes, I wanted to jump in and say the same. Um, also, I wasn't so eloquent in our last meeting, but I, I really want to make sure that we're being very inclusive in terms of um, how each voter is approached and uh, the dignity that uh, each voter is given. Uh, no matter no matter what. So I, I think that I wasn't n uh, not so eloquent the last time, but I just wanted to make that point. I appreciate the word dignity. I think we want as a commission to really affirm dignity in all of the different civic engagement activities that we're undertaking. So thank you for lifting that up. Um, I would like to ask Again, if there are any other people who who are on the on this meeting call today, if you would like, give you another opportunity to make any additional comments. Um, if there is no one, and I can't see if there are any hands are raised, Francis and Guggen, do you see anyone's hands raised? No. No. Um, so it's, I mean, it sounds like right now we have um, exhausted the list of people who want to comment at this time. And we, the staff, will stay on this call in the event that someone wants to come um, and it wasn't able to make it when it started to see if anyone else would like to offer comment. But, um, and we don't have a quorum today, so I don't think I need to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting <laughs> or the hearing. Um, so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. before you go. Can we, yeah. I, I know you discussed it in the very beginning, but uh -huh. can we uh, an idea of the process as it stands right now, you know, where do we go from here? Because 
we're working with a timeline and they're talking um we heard that what what how do we get the public to know that this is available so that's going to be some kind of campaign to advertise you know going forward so i was just you know where we are going right now with the process uh, well, big. Well, focusing first on the rule. I mean, what we will do is we will look for everyone who hasn't yet emailed to send us their testimony, and then we can think about how we are going to um, factor in the feedback into finalizing the rule. Um, once the rule is finalized, which we will try to make happen in the next couple of weeks um, and it gets but then we have to submit it to the city record we may need to go through and you know if there are substantial revisions we probably need to go through Francis you can correct me here if I'm wrong if we need to go through another internal approval process and then it gets posted in the city record um, and then once it's published it goes into effect 30 days after it's published so that process should happen over the next few weeks and then when does our pro we will need to make a decision in the near future about um based on what's happening with covid how we're going to handle the in-person interpretation um as you all know for the primary there was no the city did not provide in-person interpretation BOE provided interpretation, but the city did not, um, just out of concern for uh, everyone's safety. So we're going to reach a moment in which we'll have to decide that ourselves. Um, and then based on that decision, you know, we will plan to do outreach accordingly. We did have an, we did have an outreach or awareness campaign for the primary, where we provided, you know, materials and information in multiple languages on um, how to vote absentee, because the city was encouraging people to vote absentee. Um, so the decision about whether we're going to, or when the decision for whether we're going to go forward with the in-person interpretation needs to be made, I think, and Guggen, please correct me on this, before September in order for us to ensure um, time for recruitment of interpreters. Am I right in that? Yes, yeah, so the hard deadline um, for the decision is eight weeks prior to election day. That is the absolute hard deadline, but we should make the decision before then. Yeah. And Sarah, if I might ask a question. So we were talking a lot about at the poll site um, translation. Um, what about information out in written form in a lot of the languages that we're talking about? I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'll tell you my concern is ranked choice voting we will be doing for the first time. And I, I can foresee already that there's going to be a lot of confusion uh, by the electorate on how to do this and not quite sure uh, or have faith that the BOE is going to get out information, you know, clearly and also in, in time for everyone. And also we know that they won't do it in all the languages. So it's just a, it's a question that I have and sort of see foreseeing some issues and I, I wanted to bring it up. Um. Range, range choice isn't going into effect in November, is it? No, no, it no it'll be the city, the city elections, but it, it, you know, it is coming up. I mean, it's on 21. the horizon. Yeah, 21. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah someone else That's wanted right. to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in real quick. Um, I agree with Amy in making sure that we are more proactive and helping do education around rank choice voting. Um, because that is going to, it's pretty much shifting the way that elections have been held for the history of the city. Um, I do want to mention something about translators at poll sites. 
um, I was doing some uh, election protection work on election day. And there were a ton of people who were going into the poll sites to vote. Um, some of them said that they didn't receive their ballot in the mail. Some of them uh, didn't apply for one because they didn't know that they could. Um, and I think that not having translators at the poll sites, although I understand, you know, trying to be conscious and as, uh, as cautious as possible with COVID in the moment, I do think that there was like a missed opportunity in a moment um, with that in regard, we, I think that there could have been a plan that was put together to figure it out. And I think for November, we're gonna have to figure out a plan because it's going to be a general election. And even if there's going to be uh, mail-in ballots, you know, I spoke to a ton of people who even requested that they get their ballot. And then they just at the last second were like, I don't trust the mail system. I don't trust the board of elections. I don't trust, I don't trust. I'd rather come and do it in person. So that is something that I, I want us to kind of like keep thinking about um, and really being uh, as intentional as possible as we should be as a civic engagement commission and encouraging more people to participate in elections as safely as possible. Um, one thing I do want to mention is I know that, you know, with the pandemic and everything that's happening with, related to COVID, um, that participatory budgeting has been like sort of suspended, I guess. Um, so I think that we need to, um, especially with uh, all the, all that we're seeing in the streets of people demanding uh, city invest resources appropriately, into communities and to invest in a way that uh, makes communities whole um, is important. And I wanna make sure that just because we can't do it this year that we shouldn't stop talking or planning out what participatory budgeting on a citywide level is gonna look like. Um, if anything, this last city budget uh, is really just demonstrating the power that communities have and that people have um, and how they want to uplift uh, where they think the city should be investing its funds. I want to make sure that just because we, you know, it is on pause, that we don't forget that that is a that's a charge of ours as a commission, and that we continue to move that work forward um, in planning for the future, so that we aren't, you know, stuck when we are able to move forward. I'd rather us be more proactive on participatory budgeting and actually start moving that sooner rather than later. Thank you. And I know people wanted to stop talking, but I wanted to mention that <laughs> and hang up. No, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Murad. And if I could just respond super quickly, you're raising a really, really important point. I mean, I can see, you know, I have an 80 year old father and I said to him, <laughs> you know, are you gonna to request your absentee ballot? And his answer was no. I would rather go and vote in person. So I think there's lots of people who feel that way. And and given, um, you know, just the challenges of receiving the ballot and, and all of that, I think, and that it's a it's an important election. We definitely um, are going to be keeping that in mind. I think one of the things that happened with um, you know, the primary in the city um, decision is just that there was everything was very very uncertainty uncertain and i think we've now lived with this uncertainty for a longer so like it's not as the uncertainty is not as uncertain if that makes any sense and we also have to think about sort of the provision of you know ppe and all of that stuff as we are thinking about doing in person interpretation just to make it safe for for all um, so we'll be, you know, actively engaging those questions in the coming weeks. Um, and then on the participatory budgeting piece, I mean, this isn't a meeting. We don't have a quorum. Um, so I, I don't want to, I, I really appreciate the points you've made. And I want to, I guess, just say that I have, and I think for all of us, haven't seen us so much interest in the city's budget as we have recently. and. We've been talking internally as a team about how this is 
a really important moment and um, for us to, you know, really strengthen um, this this push um, from New Yorkers to learn more um, and to get involved and have a voice um, in the budget process. And before um, before this, like if you had asked me three or four months ago, I mean, one of the greatest hurdles in my head was just that how do we raise interest and attention in a budget, you know, in the city's budget? And I, and I feel like we are now at a moment where there is so much more interest and openness to having this kind of conversation. So I'm very excited about that. And we will share more in the next meeting, but we're, we are thinking about ways, and we've talked a little bit about the digital portal that we're setting up. We will be laying down the infrastructure over the next couple of months, regardless of whether there's an allocation or not, to build a citywide process. So that will definitely continue. And we're also talking about doing a very small scale pilot. Um, and we'll be sharing more of that, you know, information with you um, in the next, you know, official meeting that we have. Um, so thank you. Thank you for saying that and for being so um, encouraging um, and for pushing us to, to really, um, you know, do the things that we are charged with doing um, um, in a way that has, you know, that is courageous. So appreciate that. No, thank you, Sarah. And I think that we should go big or go home on participatory budgeting. I've said this from day one. And I think with the movement that we're seeing, we should definitely be allocating at least like 10% of the city's budget or at least 10 billion. I'm gonna leave it at that. Even though I know that 10% of the city's budget is not 10 billion, but we should go with 10 billion. Thanks, bye. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hi, I just wanna note that uh, Shahana Masoom had her hand raised. I just want to know if she still has a uh, would like to offer testimony. Um, you know, I just uh, kind of um, Murad answer. You know, he mentioned the uh, issue. I want to mention that in that is coming up the November is 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 a huge. Uh, it's a big election coming, especially for you know our city, and. Um, um, I what I have seen last um, early election and the. Um, the election day, um, there is a many, um, you know, many people uh, when they ca the the uh, polling site, they were not, um, you know, affiliated their party, so it was like a blank, and they say no, we did uh, in a vote before we voted uh, on our primary, but it's not there, but just think somebody has a language barrier. And I was, um, coordinator for one of the center is, uh, in a Staten Island. And when my, uh, interpreter was helping one of the Spanish speaking voters, believe me, this voter couldn't keep up because there is so many questions come so many things they need to ask. And um, it's very difficult for the, um, you know, other, um, I mean, who doesn't speak English? So it's, you know, this interpreter is very much is uh, needed the coming election. So we need to focus that as soon as possible and we need to make this faster process. Thank you. Do the commissioners have any um, clarifying questions for Shahana? Thank you so much, Shahana. Okay, um, if, if no one else has a comment or a question, um you are free to depart <laughs> um and we will stay in touch um as we revise the rule with the commissioners um and also share 
please encouraging anyone who spoke today to please submit your written comment as soon as possible and, and the team will stay on to see if anyone else joins great do we have a date for the next meeting not yet okay but, um last year last summer because we're just a year old we did not meet over in july and august but i'm wondering if we ought to meet in august um to talk through some of the election stuff so we'll be we'll be in touch about that I, I, since I, I, we're I, doing it i'm sorry i don't know i was just saying i'm not sure if people are going to be away but it's virtual so hopefully people can join that was my point too is that uh um as long as i uh, i don't think i'll be away but if i am i'll make sure I, there's wi-fi Very good. Well, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. the work of the staff. Thank you all. Good to see everybody. Bye. Good to see you too. So how do you, I mean, for Murad is still with us. <laughs> Are you guys having like a staff meeting? <laughs> no, oh, okay. we're, just, we're just waiting. If you want to leave, you can. We're just waiting because we said that this was going till six in case somebody calls in later or something. We just want to be here. I'll be on for a second. Um, I, I still want to talk about PB and I think that we should definitely be like doing a full hearing on it. A hearing? Yeah. What do you mean? I think we should do like a public engagement strategy on like getting from people what they think we should be doing. You know, I know we've been out, up and out, up and out as a commission mm -hmm. right now. Um, and I think it's really important that we like you know, I've been saying this since we started the conversations on PB as a commission, but yeah. I think we, we have to strike when the iron's hot. And I think that right now, like, people are incredibly interested in the budget and being able to, as residents of the city, rightfully say where the money of the city should be going. You know, it's tax dollars and it's their money that they're giving the city. Um, and I think that we have a really great opportunity right now to start leading the way in what it could look like and taking the cues from people in communities across the city and letting us know what they want to see money going to, how they want to get there. And I think that this past city budget election, you know, if anything, only raised the bar further on having people think about where their money goes as a city and really investing in communities and not in, uh, you know, agencies that are going to utilize their power against communities of color. So like the defunding of the NYPD by a billion, while it didn't happen, it really started a question, uh, to question what does community policing look like, right? It, what is the role of a police officer in our community? What is the, how can we as a community be better able to serve the people who live here in a way that makes the most sense. And I think those are all valid and great questions. And, you know, folks in the black community, leaders, organizers have been leading the way on what that could look like with PD. And I think that that's a great place to start. And we can expand this even further um, in thinking about how, like, you know, housing, um, department of transit, like, I know that. Department of Transportation is already doing some stuff, but like really an investment that the communities across the city will be able to like realize um, early on. And I'll stop. Yeah. I keep saying that, but I keep talking. So I'll just- No, it's great. It's great to hear you. Um, I, I think um, we do have, we have um, 
a participatory budgeting advisory committee meeting coming up. So we'll send you that info if you want to join the conversation there. Yeah, definitely do, please. Yeah. So I see on my screen someone named Ravi Reddy. Hi, uh, I'm Robbie Reddy. Uh, I'm the new um, uh, associate director for advocacy and policy at the Asian American Federation. Oh, um, great! Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, sitting and watching and listening and kind of apprising myself. Um, this is uh, you know I, I just started this job, so I'm getting used to uh, you know enmeshed in these conversations and listening to how this ecosystem is working. So uh, thanks for inviting us. Oh, great. Glad to have you. It's very, it's very nice to have people, you know, participate in this kind of space and um, we look forward to staying in touch and working with you all. Absolutely. Um, I'm seeing another person which says user. I don't know if that's someone from our team or someone else. I believe that's Ali. Is it Ali Kaba? I believe so. Okay. Um, I didn't say this but uh, earlier, but uh, thank you all for the work you're doing. Um, I know that it is a very difficult time uh, that we're all living through, but I want to make sure that uh, you all know that it is genuinely appreciated. Um, and I just want to thank, you know, Sarah, Doug and Daniel, everyone in, uh, you know, at Pacific Engagement Commission for their hard work. Uh, and also keeping us like updated on things that are happening. Um, it's generally appreciated. And Francois or Francis, uh, Francis, thank you for your constant daily emails. I don't know if people thank you for that, uh, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs>
Thanks, Murad, for all you do as well. You must serve on like a gazillion commissions and, and representative bodies. I don't, I don't know uh, how you do that. <laughs> No, nah, this is the only commission that I'm on right now, but I am on a bunch of other boards uh, and those are, you know, equally rigorous, especially in the times that we're living in right now. like someone just joined us. Hi, um, did someone just join the public hearing on the proposed tool? It does show user. I want, this, is, this is Ali, I wanted to say. Hey, I'm sorry, a little earlier, my voice was kind of breaking up. This is my first time that I'm doing this, so hopefully next time I will do a better job. And I'm really, really sorry due to the noise as well. But I hope, uh, hopefully you guys all understood what I said and how that I will definitely send uh, my great time on testament. Definitely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ali. And we definitely heard um, what you shared earlier. It added a lot of value to this conversation um, and we'll look out for your written testimony. Thank you so much for joining. You did fine. <laughs> so we still don't know the other user. That's okay.
Okay. Dr. Seed, would you like to call a meeting to a close? Uh, yes, I hereby now call the meeting or the public hearing to a close. We're at the end. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So we, I think we can all get off the phone unless, yes. or the phone and computer. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you folks want to have a debrief?